Good afternoon, everybody. It's time to get started because uh, we've got the information packed program today. Um, happy March to everybody. Uh, my name is Connie Gabe, and I want to welcome you to Project Green's uh, final uh, Gun Sunday Garden Forum for 2018. Uh, thanks for coming out and joining us today. I'm uh, confident you'll, that you will be glad that you did. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to thank our partner, Iowa City Public Library, uh, and Beth and Lily, for our, our, that are our tech gurus, um, for setting up the room and making sure all the equipment is operational. I we'll hope it stays operational. Um, through the years, our nonprofit organization has funded over two million in projects, including the Public Garden at the city-owned Ned Ashton House at Park Road and Terry Trueblood Recreational Area. Our all-volunteer effort has grown to include planting and maintaining parks, roadsides, riverfronts, medians, and public school grounds. This year, we celebrate our 50th anniversary of service to the community. We look forward to our annual plant sale on Saturday, um, May 5th, and our garden tour on Saturday, June 23rd. And in conjunction with that, you probably noticed the beautiful quilt we have in the back. And uh, that is being raffled off. And you can see the ladies by the quilt there to sign up to get a raffle ticket. Um, and those that will be, uh, again, on display with a lot of other beautiful quilts at our garden um, tour on June 23rd. And then it will be, uh, the raffle will conclude that day and the drawing will be, on June 24th on Sunday and you don't need pre to be present to win or anything for the raffle so that will be no problem. Um, we thank our door prize contributors today, uh, Garden Design Magazine, uh, Iowa City Landscaping and Garden Center, uh, Moss that is a fairly new retail store here in Iowa City. Yeah, and it's a, and, and there's a nice door prize there of a succulent uh, garden workshop. Um, uh, so Moss is a new contributor to, to the forums anyway. And then Project Green, um, a flashlight and a, a mug. So we've got some nice ones there. And many thanks to all the, the uh, Project Green volunteers that make this possible. It's, it's a lot of people. Uh, and finally, uh, please remember to silence your cell phones. Um, we'll start the presentation. Um, actually, they're going to be pretty distinctly two presentations. And um, Deb is going to start out with a, a presentation for about 45 minutes, uh, followed uh, and then take we'll take some questions uh, based on that presentation for a short period of time. Then we'll have a refreshment period. And then we will start after that with the second presentation, which I asked Deb to do on 2018 um, perennials and annuals, new or new things on the market and uh, tried and true, et cetera. And I think you all got a handout that, that has lists of those two. And then after that distinct presentation, we'll have another uh, question period. Um, and I do have a sheet up here in the front if you'd rather write down your question than, than ask it. Um, today, I am very pleased to introduce Deb Walzer. Um, Deb is a recently retired, long time, she told me 21 years, uh, perennial expert at Peck's Green Thumb Nursery in Cedar Rapids, and she's an active, very, very active, um, Lynn County Master Gardener. I know Deb is familiar to many of you from getting her expert advice at Peck's or attending and participating in Master Gardener meetings and events um, or attending our past, um, uh, our past Project Green forums. Um, according to records I inherited, Deb spoke to our group in 2009 and 2011 and got rave reviews. Um, I, however, hadn't had the pleasure of, of seeing her speak or her presentation, so I decided it was time to have her back. Um, and Deb is fresh off her presentation to the Lynn County Garden Fair yesterday, so she's all warmed up to share her enthusiasm about growing berries um, which began as a child in her grandmother's raspberry patch. At my request, Deb will also provide us with her list of the best annuals and perennials for 2018. So please help me in welcoming Deb Walzer.
Okay, that's enough. I don't like being paused before I do a presentation because I really could be bad. And you, know, you don't want to, to build me up too much because I could really stink. Um, I, I, as a grandmother, I now know that grandma sent us to the raspberry patch to get rid of us. <laughs> the three of us in her little house was probably too much. And I have um, four grandchildren and one on the way. so. I can understand. I had them about uh, two hours ago. I had three out of the five, or four. We keep thinking of this fifth one already. Um, but that was more than enough. OK. Where do I stand? So, so I'm not coming. Anyway, um, I'm really glad to be here. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, in my blueberries and, and in my patch in my backyard, I don't have raspberries yet, but I'm looking forward to it. I think the mic quit. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. OK. Maybe it's just me. OK. But I do have blueberries. I've had blueberries for about 25 years. Um, I have strawberries. And the grandkids, when they come over to my house, that's the first thing they go for. I've got um, several different types of blueberries. And we're going to start with blueberries. This is Elizabeth Cole Whiteman, White, White Cole, Coleman White. And she was the first one to package blueberries. So, and this was quite a, while, a few years ago. And New Jersey happens to be the leading provider of high bush ones. The high bush are the ones that we get at the grocery store, the big ones. Now, Maine also is a blueberry state. And you wouldn't think about that. The lobster's not very happy that he's being pushed out by the blueberries. <laughs> but it is uh, the largest of the half high. 25% of all the half high bushes or blueberries come from there. And I think it's really interesting here down at the bottom here that main crop requires 50,000 bee hives to pollinate their blueberries. Not just 50,000 bees, but bee hives. And they are trucked from field to field to field to field to get all those blueberries pollinated. Isn't it glad we've got bees in our, in our life? Really nice. In 2003, blueberries became a superfruit because of all the antioxidants in it. And again, the most important thing I think here is the bottom of the statement here, where it's actually helping with Alzheimer's disease, so keep making sure that we still have the memory. This is a, true to my heart, because my father had Alzheimer's. Now, blueberries are not just for the berries. The foliage is very nice. It makes a good foundation planting, because you're going to have these reds. And, and so, so not just the, the, um, the fruit that we get from it, but, but it's a wonderful shrub also. This is my shrub. So you got all kinds of different colors. Mine's a little bit more burgundy, where some of them are a lot more red. So it just depends on the plant. Um, the plants right now are dormant. They need 1,000 hours. Let's see, 1,000 hours at temperatures above 45. So if we get some really cold stuff that we had, and they, they just stop, they have to have 1,000 hours of cooling in order for them to produce fruit. I think that this last week has helped us a lot because it is above 45 or uh, below 45 at night, so that's good. Uh, warm will make the plants go dormant. Long freezing will make them um, not complete their dormancy, and uh, the chilling factor is really important for the blueberries. Frost damage is really important too because they bloom so early that if we have a, a late frost in April or May, they could lose their terminal buds, they could lose their flowers, they could use, lose their leaves. So I, with mine, I cover them. I cover them if it's going to get cold. I cover them when the guy's going to come and spray the deck off. Because I, would, I don't want those flowers to be knocked off or, or not get done or anything. Last year, in the, the, in the fall, I remove the terminal bud. On all of my plants, I just take the top two inches off because that makes those secondary buds turn into terminal buds. Terminal buds have fruit. Secondary buds have some fruit, but not as much as a terminal bud. So I want a lot more terminal buds so I have a lot more fruit. Um, and so, as it says, and I'm not going to read this to you. You guys can read, right? But as it says, you know, it's going to make, make it into a secondary bud. In the spring, the sugars start coming up from the roots. The roots and the branches are going to grow at the same rate. And we're going to get 
a lot of a lot of flowers. Pretty? Can't wait. Fertilizer is not necessary at this time. In fact, fertilizer is not necessary for blueberries very much at all, you know, because they're going to be fine. Water, on the other hand, is really important. They're going to take one and a half to three inches more water. So usually when we're talking about our plants, it's one inch per week. This is three inches per week. One of the things that I do with my blueberries is I've got rain barrels. And anything to, and my overflow from my rain barrels flows into my blueberries. So they're getting the extra water. So I get an inch of rain plus three inches of rain that goes into my rain barrel. So you want to keep them really, really moist. If they're too wet, they drown. If they're too dry, their roots are going to go down, and then they can't get the surface water because they are very shallow rooted. You're probably talking about four inches below the surface is where those roots are because they want all of that rainwater into their roots. So the effects, they can dry out. That will be immediate and long lasting. If they're too wet or if they've got a drought, it's going to decrease the size because the water in those blueberries is in the first month, the first month. And so flowers are six to 12 flowers on that terminal bud. And that's six to 12 berries. The first, but they're all, the, the, the final size is determined a month after they flower. Oh, and again, there's that water word again. They need a lot of water as they're growing. It reduces the growth of new branches and new roots. And we want to make sure that these have all the water that they can possibly have. Selecting a site, full sun, six hours minimum, well-drained, acid soil. That's very important. Great planting in any plant grounds that doesn't drain like, like uh, clay or sand and gravelly. So we need to prepare the soil because our, our pH in, in Iowa is about six, about neutral. We need to pre prepare our thing, our, our bed, to 4.5 to 5.5. So that's very, very important. Um, blueberry plants live to 30 to 50 years or longer. So it's well worth making that because they're going to be longer than I am. So, yeah, so pH is too high, growth plant is slow, foliage turns yellow. And I think that's what I hear a lot from people is that my plants aren't growing and their leaves are yellow. Well, the pH isn't set right. So you got to check the pH and you can do that with it. If it's too high, plants will die. <coughs> so do a soil test, adjust your, your pH. Um, four to six hours of sphagnum peat moss uh, when you're planting is a really good idea. Top dress that. As that biodegrades, it's going to acidify the soil. You can also go faster by do using a, aluminum sulfur elemental sulfur, and, and of course we're going to mulch that area too. Um, there are other sulfurs that will acidify the soil, um, iron sulfate. We used to use aluminum sulfate on that a lot, but aluminum also has a, cling, uh, a, a link to Alzheimer's disease, so we're not using uh, aluminum sulfate on anything we might eat. Incorporating have a, a bed that's going to hold water and, and compost will hold 10 times more water than any other um, soil additive so by adding the organic matter we're going to actually hold more water and the plants need more water so this is a good thing how many times did I say water <laughs> am I at 12 yet I usually go about 12 before I say, stop talking water um, blueberries this is these are my blueberries and my friend um, the blueberries, uh, it's better to put them in a whole row instead of one here, one here. It's easier to adjust your soil in a whole row than it is to do one hole at a time. Blueberries in containers. This is a, a really interesting thing. In fact, every year I'll go buy a blueberry in a container with blueberries on it and I'll put it on my deck. And then we'll eat blueberries all summer long and in the fall, I add it to my blueberry beds. But it's really kind of nice. Winter protection is a problem if you're going to keep it in that container. 
You're going to take it into an unheated garage. Once the leaves have turned really red and the fire falling off, you're going to wrap it with a blanket and you're going to water it once a month. I just put them in the ground. That's too much work for me. So, but you can do that. I, um, high bush will get to be six foot tall. You can put that in a, a big pot like a whiskey barrel size, half whiskey barrel. A uh, good planting mix. We see this a lot. Organic matter, peat moss, compost. Sometimes we'll use vermiculite as our one third, one third, one third. This is a nice loose soil. It's going to make the roots travel nicely through the pot. And of course, we're talking about the first four inches again. That these are um, very shallow rooted, but they'll be able to get watered really, really well. But I love my blueberries on the deck. Selecting a cultivar. There's three different cultivars that are grown in Iowa. We've got high bush, we've got half highs, and we've got low bush. Um, the, and we want to plant more than one cultivar. So when I show you the names of these, you need to pick two names. Because they're, they are self-pollinating, but they'll pollinate better if you have two different named cultivars. Um, and that's very important. Um, the different cultivars also are the different um, sizes. Bloom at different times and produce at different times. So in my yard where I've got all three varieties, I get, blue, I get berries from July all the way through August. Most of the time it's just July. So by having the different color sizes, it works. Here's a high bush, and this is the berries that we see in the grocery store. The really big berries. It gets to be six feet tall, six feet wide. I have a friend who has a six foot son, and he did this on the backside of his bushes, and you couldn't see his fingers. It was that wide. And the, the berries on it looked like grape clusters. They were just wonderful. She sold that farm, too. Should have gone and dug that blueberry. Here are, here are five different varieties of high bush. Um, in my garden, I started with an Elliot. I got my Elliot at Kmart when they sell plants. And they were doing 75% off all blooming plants. And the man there was not a plant geek like I am. But I said, well, they do flower. So I got my Elliot's for 75% off the price. <laughs> what can I say? He looked in his little book and he couldn't even find the, the, the genus for it. He couldn't <laughs> find it in his little book. But I got my Elliot's very, very cheap. I also got a, 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 um, a red maple, Japanese maple, at the same 75% off. It didn't flower, but he didn't know that either. <laughs> Half high blueberries are a cross between the low bush and the high bush. They're going to be about three, four foot tall. Um, they've got medium-sized berries on them, and they're very cold hardy also. And here's the, the half highs. You should have that on your list, I think. So circle two, because you want to have two different cultivars. I have um, North Country and North Blue in my gardens right now. Who knows what I'll be adding next year, because, you know, I'll go to the big box store and buy one already in bloom with fruit on it. And it might be something different. Low bush are more of a ground cover. These are the ones that you find in the woods in Minnesota that have one or two little tiny berries on them. It tends to sucker out really well. I've got one in my garden because one is more than enough because it's taking up room. Um, but the one the nice thing about the one is that my grandchildren are able to get to that one first. It's the first one to bloom and the first one to produce berries. The second one is the half eye. It's going to bloom a little bit later than the low bush but earlier than the high bush. The high bush is the last one. So the high bush are the ones that I am able to eat all the way through August. And then by then I'm tired of blueberries and I get my grand, two eight-year-old grandsons, each with a cottage cheese container, and they fill up all the blueberries into the thing and then I freeze them. So I've got blueberries in my, in my basement right now that go wonderful in a spice cake muffin. Wonderful. Okay, top hat. This is probably your low bush. It's a, actually a compact low bush. We see this in the back of the parade magazine a lot. Top hack blueberry, container blueberry, grape blueberry, or this. But remember, keeping it in the container, you're going to have winter protection, or you're going to plant it in the ground. You can even plant it pot and all in the ground and pull it in the spring and 
and use it the second year. Pot and all. Just pull it up when, it, when we can get it out. This is a new variety as, as of last year. And I think I bought one, but you know, have you ever wa wander through your garden and say, did I plant that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got that problem too? I don't remember planting that. So I think it's in my garden, but I'm not sure yet. But it is in there. But it's a two crop. It's going to bloom in June and July and then in August and September. Isn't that cool? So even me, who gets tired of my blueberries in August, can still have more in September. It's kind of cool. This is pink lemonade. Now, pink lemonade hit the market about five years ago. And one of my coworkers says, it never forms fruit. It's just ornamental. It's not going to form any fruit. There's my fruit off of pink lemonade. Now, they don't taste as good when they're pink. You know, it's kind of like you eating a lavender blueberry. They're not good. You got to wait for them to be blue. But it does turn pink, and they are very good. The kids like them. So that's OK. Look at that. Huge. You got to be patient. The, fr the fruit production is going to hinder the growth of the plant. So that first year, when you plant that plant, you take all of the flowers off and all the berries off. Who's strong enough to do that? <laughs> Not I. There's got to be a little bit left so I can have some instant gratification, because that's what we're all about, is instant gratification. But it is important to, to let them grow till next year. And then next year, you can have as many berries as you want. We want to put down good root systems. We want to make sure they get watered well, that the pH is settled well. We want to make sure that all that's ready. Now, when the berries are ripe, we roll them between our fingers. If they come off, they're ripe. If they don't come off, you got to tug them off, they're going to be very tart. You want to wait for them to be able to roll off, your, off with your fingers. Mulch is really important, and this is going to be for the strawberries and the blueberries and the raspberries. All of them we need to mulch because they don't need the competition. So we don't want to have any weeds around them, any, any grasses that are coming up on them. And I know my strawberries have a lot of grass in them. But they don't need that comp competition. So we want to make sure that, that we're going to be mulching. It's going to help us with water conservation. And I think I just said that 13 times, didn't I? Water is important. Blueberry pruning. Basically, you're going to prune out any of the things that are going the wrong way if they're crossing. You're going to do some of the sh uh, really skinny whips that come out. Take those out. Anything that's damaged. And several years down the road, your bushes are going to have gray branches instead of red branches. You're going to prune the gray out. But that's several years down the road. For the first few years, pruning is really not a big deal. Harvesting, there we go. Don't be too anxious. Two to five week uh, bloom or period in which we can harvest. That's longer if you mix your cultivars or your heights because you're going to get early. Gently roll the berry between your fingers to have it come off. I have not seen any of these pests except for the neighbor kids. <laughs> they, my husband would come home and he'd go to the at 5 o'clock, he'd go and get some blueberries, and they were gone. And it was the neighbor kids. I now have a gate to my blueberries that you have to open from the inside, and you have to be as tall as me to get there. So they can't get to them. But the biggest problem I've had with insects is one of my plants likes the Japanese beetles like it. But most of these things I've never seen before. OK, now on to strawberries. Aren't they pretty? Same kind of location, full sun. Um, we need to have full sun and six hours of sun. Leaf and root are often with wet soils. We don't want wet soils. Remove those perennial weeds because they don't need the competition. And avoid sites where tomatoes, potatoes, and peppers have been planted. Strawberries don't like those. They hinder the growth. They, say, they share the same diseases. So we don't want to put those in there. So strawberries are irresistible. They're easy, hardy, to grow, hardy and easy to grow. They make excellent jams, pies, and, and jellies. Now, I don't talk a lot about that. 
I'm all about the instant gratification. I want to eat them now. I don't care if they're going to make jellies or anything like that. We do have a master gardener that talks a lot about the jellies and the preserving. The most preserving I do is put my blueberries in the freezer. That's it. So home gardeners can choose from three different types of strawberries. We got June bearing. These are the ones that the, the people that are going to make the jams and jellies are because you get all your berries all at once. And then you're done. All your berries at once. And there's four different varieties there. I think I put that on your list, but I'm not sure. Um, Early Go, um, All Star Honey Oil, and Sure Crop. These are ones that I've seen at the nurseries um, not too long ago. The next ones are Everbearing. Isn't that cool with the red flowers? That is, um, that's Tristan, and there's a couple other varieties. These have elongated berries, and on my back deck, right outside the sliding glass door, I usually have a basket of these, so the grandkids can go and they can pick the strawberries right there in a hanging pot on my deck. So they, they really like that. Um, the, the Ozark berry uh, beauty will not have red flowers, but I really like this red flower. At the end of the season, this the strawberry goes into my strawberry patch. So I have white and red flowers in my strawberry patch. It's really kind of cool. You look, need to look for that one. Um, I, I usually get mine from Swift. You guys have, have the Swift service any of your places around here? But that's really cool. Day neutral. These don't have, have sunlight or nighttime. It doesn't matter when they are, but they are going to bloom all summer long, all the way up until October. This is the one that I will plant. I plant TriStar, and I just put some seascape into my garden because these are going to give me berries all the way till October. Not the huge amount to make jelly out of, but instant gratification. I can eat a handful every day out of my strawberries. Where are you going to buy these? Quality garden centers. Some that has quality plants, or a mail order catalog that is certified. You want to make sure they're certified disease resistant. Don't get them from your neighbor because they have lots, because they are not probably disease resistant like the newer varieties are. If they come to you too early and there's still snow on the ground and you can't get them in the ground, put them in the refrigerator. Keep them cool. They're going to look like this when they come. Up here is, is what you usually get, 20, 25 in a, pie, in a bundle. Go ahead and put those in the refrigerator. The best part about the, the plants are, is the, or the most important part is the way we plant them. You can see the crown is right here, and that's where the roots start right there, and that's where you need to plant them. So often we plant them too deep, and you see what the leaves are doing when you plant them too deep? You don't get as big of leaves, and it's taking a lot more energy for them to come up. Shallow, those roots are going to dry at the top. So we want to make sure. This one here, the roots are crooked. Let's make sure the roots, the roots aren't crooked. You won't get crooked strawberries. Or, but, you, you know, it's just not going to grow as well as it could be. So here's the plant spacing. 12 to 18 to 24 inches apart, and rows 18 to 24 inches wide. So you can plant a, a whole bed of them. You can plant rows of them. I like to do a square foot gardening. That's another talk that I think I did here a few years ago. Um, but this is my strawberry bed. The ones that are up here did not survive because of the whole idea of raised up and the sun or the wind and the cold freezing and thawing them. Those did not survive. So that top tier is not there anymore. It's just a four foot by four foot bed. It's big enough for myself and my husband and all my grandkids. Well, three out of the four, because the fourth one hasn't figured it out yet. So, but she will. She'll need two. Um, right this whole area. Um, be two foot apart because they don't make as many runners. Or one foot apart because they don't make as much runners. After you're planting, you're going to plant them with, uh, with um, put some water-soluble fertilizer on each of those plants. Iowa State recommends a 10-5-10. Can't find it. So a 10-10-10 is just fine for, for your first um, feeding of your um, strawberries. You don't have to worry about it too often. 
once that, once that first one's done, if you've got good soil, you're going to be fine. Remove all the blossoms. First year, you remove all the blossoms to the 1st of July. The June bearing will not give you berries until next year. The ever bearing and the day neutral will start making flowers and give you fruit this year. Remember instant gratification? Oh. So you have to wait with the June bearing if you're going to do June bearing. One plant will give you one and a half quarts of fruit. One plant. So if you start with 12 plants, you're doing good. 12 quarts of strawberries. I don't know if I could actually measure that because I'm eating them as fast as I'm <laughs> picking them. They never hit a jar. This one's something we've just been seeing in the market lately, and it's a white strawberry that tastes like pineapple. It's a cross between strawberry and pineapple, so it's probably just like one of those Welch's juices we eat or see where they've combined two of them. Um, saw it last year, didn't see it um, produce any fruit. It did flower, but I'm kind of wanting to, uh, to see if I can get it in my garden. Now this one is fake. Someone played with the color on this because it's actually a dark red, almost purple. It's not black. It's not black. So this is a fake strawberry, and you're seeing seeds of it. You'll Google it and pay $50 for 50 seeds. Save your money. Buy real strawberries. OK, we're on to raspberries now. And raspberries are wonderful. I don't have raspberries in my yard right now because my husband has teeth problems and he doesn't like the seeds. So there's a couple here that don't have as big as seeds that I'm going to be planting this year. Um, they, again, they're a favorite. They're easy to grow. They're hardy. You can put them in jelly and jams, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about eating them right and fresh. There's four types that you can, actually five types, that you can grow. You're black, you're purple, you're yellow, summer bearing, and fall bearing. Again, location, full sun, competition with leaves, well-drained well soil. pH of 6 was just fine. That's us. We're in, the, in pH of 6. Raised beds can improve drainage if you've got the clay that you're planting on top of. Um, prepare your site in the summer or fall for next year's planting. Oh, well, we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. We can do anything we want. We're gardeners. Um, the early soil, soil preparation will um, be easier to do if you prepared it last year and then planted early in the spring. We can do it. We're gardeners. Black raspberries. There's several different varieties of black raspberries. Um, an Iowa State introduction, high, high yielding black berry, berries, zone three to nine. Those are very pretty, aren't they? Those wonderful. They almost look like blackberries instead of black raspberries. I mean, I got the wrong photo. Um, Bristol, another favorite um, that we've seen in the nurseries around here, summer, midsummer fruiting. Jewel is another variety that has uh, got good flavor to it and a nice big round berries on it too. The purple raspberries, we've got Brandywine, which uh, was a Cornell University introduction. And we get a lot of stuff from Cornell. A lot of our information comes from Cornell because they've got a really good um, publications that we can get to. And then Royalty, which is sweeter than Brandywine. Can you imagine something sweeter than Brandywine? The yellow raspberries, we got Anne, and we got Fall Gold. This is what I'm Seeds as the, the regular raspberries do. So I'm and apparently it's really, really sweet. So I'm looking forward to that. Anybody plant fall gold? I'm gonna, I saw it last year. I actually got to test it last year because if they don't sell and they bear, bear berries, isn't that a snack for the employees? <laughs> I think so. Then we got summer red raspberries, Encore and uh, Boyne. Both of those are, uh, Boyne is from Canada, so it hands, uh, handles our winters. Um, without any problem at all. Latham, another real popular one. I've seen that one sold a lot. And then our spring bearing, and their spring bearing raspberries. Those are really quite nice. 
And then there are two crops. Now, crops have a problem. They're called Japanese beetles. And a lot of people who do the two crop will mow their, ber their berries down in early spring and allow them to come up for that second crop. Um, pruning on those, you usually just take out the branches that had the little caps, the little berry caps on it. You take those branches out. But a lot of people have gotten to the point where the two crop isn't as important when we have Japanese beetles eating their berries before we can eat our berries. But those are both two crops. So you would get some in June, and then you would get some in August, all the way up to frost. This is a one crop um, fall bearing. And this is going to give you, you know, a lot of big red raspberries, wonderful raspberries. Another um, new introduction is raspberry shortcake, thornless. Thornless raspberry shortcake, it, it works really well in the container. At the nursery, we had one of these in a big pot for about four years, well, until we, <laughs> until we closed last year. And every year it would produce, and it tastes real good because, you know, it didn't sell and the employees get to eat it. So it tastes real good, and, and it was just in a big pot, and it went into an unheated greenhouse during the winter and came back out every year and fed us. Works really good. Fertilize these after planting. You know, water soluble fertilizer that you can go just plant each root or water each root when you plant. And that's all the fertilizer they're really going to need for the most part. Got good soil. Plant materials and sources again. A mail order catalog that has certified roots or a no local garden center that has certified roots. Make sure that you get the, the right thing. And again, if you have to delay planting because there's snow on the ground, moisten the roots and pack them in, the, in a cellar or garage or in, in the refrigerator. Can I tell you about the refrigerator? Um, my, fr my friend uh, Zora had some daffodils that she put in the refrigerator. And her husband had just retired, so he made chili said those onions were really hard to cut. <laughs> well, let's just say they went out to eat that night. <laughs> so be careful, well, you know, make sure you mark whatever you put in the refrigerator so your husband doesn't get handy. <laughs> okay, planting in early spring is the best time for both the, the strawberries and the raspberries and the blueberries. Um, when you're planting the raspberries, you've got two different areas, the black and red raspberries, you're gonna put two inches below the surface. Oh, no, the red ones are two inches below the surface, and the black and purple are one inch deeper than they were. And you can see where the roots are coming off on here, and that's where you know that you're not going to plant them too deeply. You position them, flatten them, and backfill and water thoroughly. And then you want to prune back the canes to three You want them to put down good roots before they start producing fruit. Isn't that cool? I'm going to build one of those for my yellow raspberries. Now this, this is interesting, you know, most people who have heard But you know what? I can mow around this. I can mow off all those little suckers and if they, and I can move them back in if I want to do that too. So I think I'm going to build this. But you can see that it really only has two wires on each side supporting it. I kind of highlighted the wires because you really couldn't see it without me playing with my doctor. But isn't that cool? I really like that. You know, two, <laughs> two foot wide, eight feet long, you know, fit in, in just about any garden. Weed control, again, we want to make sure that we mulch real well. We don't need, they don't need any competition. Three to four inches of fine material. Um, usually I would stay away from sawdust because as a master gardener, you know that sawdust e eats up nitrogen. So we don't want it to eat up the uh, nitrogen. We want to put something like straw or oak leaves or even wood mulch, because it's not going to eat up the sawdust, I don't think would work real well. This guy's kind of, um, I don't know, he's really growing strawberries, isn't he? Or raspberries. So he's got irrigation between each of his rows to make sure that they provide the water. And remember, these are shallow rooted, so the soaker hoses will work really well for him to get those roots nice and established. I had four sheets on pruning for the five, five different varieties. And I thought, all your eyes were going to glaze over. 
if I, if I did that. In general, you, cu you cut off the ones that had fruit on the, the year before. Some varieties you can cut all the way to the ground and you'll have earlier or later. So it's just kind of, you know, with each different type of raspberry, you do need to check the pruning on it. Um, Iowa State has some wonderful brochures on how to prune them, and it has all five varieties on how to prune them. But in general, you just to remove the ones that, are, that have the caps. Harvesting. Harvest when they're fully red, they can be stored in the refrigerator only three to five days. So eat them fast. <laughs> eat them fast because we don't want to have to refrigerate them really long. Um, they get kind of slimy if they're in the refrigerator for too long. It's time to pick some more. Okay. <laughs> this is our break time. Um, this is my email address. If you would like a copy of this, I will send it to you as a PDF if you email me. My history was um, 21 years with Pex Nursery, and um, I took over the nursery or the perennial area. So. And every year, my boss, my, my, my nice boss, would give me the list next year. And so I would look at that list, and I would highlight anything I hadn't seen before. And that became my new, new perennial presentation that I've done since 2008, every year, 2008. Um, this year, PEX is gone. My boss didn't order any, anything in, obviously. If you've been by PEX in Cedar Rapids, it is a large field of nothing. They bulldoze the whole thing. And they're putting up strip malls because we don't have enough strip malls in Iowa. So anyway, um, this was a little bit more of a challenge than being able to take her list and highlight. So I, I went out online and I found a lot of things that say they're new um, from Walters, Monrovia, Proven Winners, and a couple other places too. But I, I want to show you first what, what I've got up here. That's a purple coneflower. You, you can tell, right? <laughs> OK, because that's a purple coneflower. Um, and this is um, Maya Stilbys in my backyard. Um, I love Maya Stilbys. Maya Stilbys are growing in full sun because I live in swamp water. You can go out in the middle of my backyard in August with your bare feet, and I sink up to my ankles in water. So it's a, it's a very, I live by the spring house if you're familiar. So I've got spring water that waters my back lawn a lot. So my astilbies do very, very well in that swampy water. A lot of people have problems with astilbies is because they're not watering them enough. Think blueberries. <laughs> okay, this here is a, a, a lungwort or the pulmonaria. One of my favorite flowers because it blooms really early and it brings the hummingbirds to my backyard. The hummingbirds love the flowers on that. And then when it's all done, I take those flowers and I drop the stems and I step on them. And they, they start um, growing. They spread by seed. I've actually got a picture of one in, that volunteered itself into full sun. It also is a shade plant. Um, the, the hosta up there, we see these in the parade magazine too, the white hosta, white Christmas, all these. Well, the difference between this one, this is Dancing Queen, and the, the white ones in the parade magazines come up white, but they turn green. This one comes up chartreuse and stays chartreuse. So that's a Dancing Queen, and it's a, it's a little one. It's not a big one. So we're going to start with some terms that you probably don't need to, to do, but I never know if I've got beginning gardeners or I've got expert gardeners here. Are there any beginning gardeners here? No. So you guys, just you, okay. <laughs> Um, the terms that, that confuse people, Latin. I don't talk Latin unless it's something fun to say, like simisifusia or lysomachia. You know, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk Latin that, that way. Um, most of these have their Latin name down because it's important to know the Latin. If you're looking for a coneflower and the person you're talking to say, thinks you said cornflower, we need to know what's the first letter of the, the Latin. If it's an E, it's a purple coneflower. If it's a C, it's a bachelor button. So we want to know what, which, which plant we're talking about. So Latin is that important, that. Perennials, you plant them once, they come back year after year, God willing. 
Okay? <laughs> Annuals, live fast, die young. One year. <laughs> unless, unless they're my snapdragons, which tend to self-seed themselves, so that's okay. Okay. Biannual is a little confusing because the first year it's a plant. That plant dies to the ground. The second year that plant comes up and flowers and drops seeds. That plant dies in the winter. The seedlings come up the next year and they're just a plant. They die back that, that third year and they come up, they flower and they drop seeds. Some things like um, hollyhocks, um, uh, Chinese lanterns, a lot of, some of the campanulas, the bells of England, those are all biannuals. And I, don't, uh, I didn't sell a lot of those because people got mad when their plant died after a year. <laughs> so I didn't like that. So I don't want to do that. The sun part sun, shade part shade, these are what you see on the back of the tag. If it says sun part sun, it means it would prefer full sun, but can tolerate part shade. If it says shade part shade, it would prefer full shade, but can tolerate part shade. That, that's easy, right? The tags are really, really important. Deadheading is when we cut the old flowers off to keep them blooming, like we do in our purple cone flowers. Now, I don't cut just the flower off. I go down to where it meets the stem because that energy from that flower stem, the old flower stem, is taking energy from your plant. Get rid of that so it can put it back into making more flowers. Cutting back, how many people have those hostas that look beautiful and they come up and they do this? Cut them back. If they're this tall on the 4th of July, put the bratwurst on and go out and cut them back by half. Cut them back by half. So if it's 10 inches tall, 12 inches tall, cut it down to six. That way it's still going to flower. It's going to flower a little bit later than, uh, than it would otherwise, but um, it's going to have more stems to hold that, the weight of those flowers. Now I go around, with, I've got my kids toboggan with a rope on it, and I go from one plant to the next plant to the next plant and cut them all off. You are talking hostas. I'm talking sedum, sorry. Oh, I'm Did sorry. I say hostum? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's been a long day. <laughs> oh, not hosta. I'm sorry. The sedums. Everybody, okay, how many have sedums that go like that? Okay, now we got it. <laughs> sorry about that. Same thing you do is with the um, bee bombs. You know, your four foot bee bombs? They get really ugly legs, cut them halfway back. Then they're going to cover up the ugly legs of the guys behind them, and the ones in front will be a little shorter, and they'll still bloom for you. So right around the 4th of July. OK, zones are a guideline. This is Iowa. This is the new map that, that Iowa State has passed on to us. And if you look here, this is zone 4. That's zone 4. This is all zone 5A. This is 5B, and there's a little bit of 6 down there, way down at the bottom. So we are in zone 5. According to the, the average map from 1976 to 2005. Why is this happening? We're not going to talk politics. <laughs> this is the first one on your list. This is Chantilly Lace. It's a goat's beard. And the, this is a short goat's beard. It only gets to be 30 inches tall. Uh, most goat's beer are taller than I am. Uh, blooms wonderful white in early summer, late spring. And it will repeat bloom in the fall. So it's really kind of neat. It's a shade plant. And, the, and I, yesterday's class, they said you didn't put down if they were shade or sun. This is a shade plant. Baptisia. How many have all the Baptisias that they put out? Me too. I love Baptisia. Um, this is a native plant, Baptisia is. Um, the native plant, the purple one that, that was the original, the Native Americans would use the purple flowers as purple dye for their costumes. And the seed pods became rattles. Now this one, is uh, pink lemonade, is just wonderful. It's got the pink outer catkins and the yellow flower on the inside. Isn't that cool? And 48 inches tall. Now, Usually when I talk to about plants that are 48 inches tall, we talk about tomato cages. We'll get to that. But this one doesn't need a tomato cage. This is a dark chocolate, and this is darker than the other chocolate um, that in the Baptisia family. But the difference is that this holds all its flowers above the foliage, where the other ones, the flowers are in the foliage. So you can't see it as well. 
But look how, how nice and stiff that, that branches are. You know, right in here. They're just coming out of one area and they just get thicker and thicker every year. It doesn't really multiply in size. It just gets thicker and thicker every year. 30, three and a half foot tall. Stand my meat clematis. This is a bell clematis. And it's only supposed to be about 40, 38 inches tall. The bell clematis that I have at my house gets to be about six foot, and I've got them in, a, in an obelisk to support it. This one also says that it might need a little bit of support. So you put it in a, in a tomato cage, would hold it up. Red hot vanilla coreopsis. This coreopsis starts off yellow with that red center, and as the flower ages, it turns all red. Isn't that cool? That's a coreopsis. Oh, you see the little deer up there? It means the deer won't eat it. Same thing with the little rabbit. You saw the rabbit? He, he, he will, they won't eat that either. Echinaceas. This is a purple coneflower. It's not purple. Um, this one's got three and a half inch flowers, which we're talking about, what, 50 cent piece, silver dollar, even bigger. Uh, really nice. It multi branches, so you get lots of flowers off of the plant instead of like your regular purple cone flower that has one or two on each branch. This is going to have lots of flowers in it. 16 inches tall. So it's a good front of the border. Will it seed out other than the pink one? That's a really good question because what I've done, even for my own shopping, is that I will Google them and see if I can find them by seed. If I can, then I know that it's going to seed this color. If I can't, it's either a sterile seed or it's going to do purple. I have a big sky sunset in my garden, one big red flower in a sea of purple because it's self-seeded itself, purple cone flower, regular purple. So be, be real careful about the echinaceas. Google them as you're looking. Even if you're standing in the parking lot of the, uh, or right by the plant, Google it and find out if it is going to be seed. Um, grow by seed or by, by not? That's a very good question. Thank you. I should have said that. Um, this is a false sunflower. This is Heliopsis. Blooms for 10 to 12 weeks. How long is our summer? Cut flower. Wonderful cut flower. You want to do it, go ahead and deadhead it to keep it blooming, but it will bloom continually all summer long. Once it starts blooming, it blooms a little bit later. You're probably not going to see it till July but it's going to bloom all the way up to frost. Cool. I don't put a lot of uh, daylilies in my program because my friend Zora is a daylily snob, and I'm not. But I really like the color of this one. I particularly like the, the ruffles along the edge. And you see how that has bleeded out a little bit lighter. This is a really pretty daylily. Day and there are lots of new daylilies that we're going to see in the nurseries this year. This was just the prettiest one, I, I thought. Oops, missed one. Uh, the corbels, a lot of the corbels that are being developed now almost look like silk flowers. They have such a nice um, feel to them, and they look almost like they're fake flowers. Um, this is a wild berry, very, very pretty, deer resistant. But I really like this one, spearmint. Look at the flowers on this. This is, again, another case of where the calyxes or the, the, the outside flower buds are colored. And then you get the flower. And then after the flower is done blooming, you've still got those calyxes that get, have your color. It's really, really kind of neat. Looking forward to seeing that one in the nursery. Look at all those flowers. Looks like a birthday cake with too many candles on it. <laughs> Uh, the hookerellas are actually a cross between the corabel and the foam flower. What does with the hookerella, that means that, or hookerella, it means that they're going to have shorter stems, fuzzy bell flowers. That's why they call them foaming bells. Yes, ma'am. Would these take direct sun better than most of the corabels? Uh, the, 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 yeah, they could. A lot of people will put the hookerellas in a container instead of um, potato vine because they'll uh, kind of go over, they get pretty wide. Um, I think they, in my gardens, they take a lot of sun. But then so, so will some of my corbels. It just depends on if you're talking about center of the front yard with no sun at all, or lots of sun, no shade. But those are all really kind of neat. 
Um, the top one with the chartreuse leaves, and then a couple of the fall colors in the bottom ones. Holy grail. This hibiscus is really quite nice. This has got eight to nine inch flowers. Um, what they advertise it is those little green, again, the flower covers, the calyxes, um, will stay all summer. So you end up with that dimension and color. When the flower falls off, you still have that calyx. It looks really, really nice. Um, burgundy leaves, maple leaf shape, and only four or five feet tall. Um, I have a, a hibiscus, a red hibiscus in my front yard. And people will stop because I got a flat sidewalks and people will walk by and they walk by and they'll say, what is that? And I said, that's a stop sign. <laughs> because you stopped and asked me what it was. <laughs> that's a stop sign. And there's another stop sign. This, one, this one's kind of neat because of the red eyes that bleed out into the petals and you've got white on this petal and pink on the other side of the petal. A very nice, nice one. Now, when I was out there looking at these um, hibiscus, there were like four pages of, this one is called, this one was cherry something, it's got a new name, and this one's got another name. I can see your eyes glazing over already. So I didn't put that in there, but a lot of the old ones like Plum Crazy and Cherry Cheesecake have a new name this year. So when you're looking at them, you may already have that Cherry Cheesecake, you don't want to buy the one that they just renamed from Cherry Cheese Cake. Hosta. Um, when you're looking at hosta, all three of these hostas have very thick corrugated leaves. Do you know what that means? No slugs. The slugs will not damage the really thick corrugated leaves. They go for those wimpy, really thin leaves like the my dance. You know, but the, if they're a thicker leaf, like our autumn frost, our coast to coast, and our water slide, they will, the, the slugs will not damage these the way they damage some of the others. So look for your hostas with the corrugated leaves, the really thick leaves, if you've got slug problems. Huh? Do you ever grow miniature hostas? No, they get lost in my garden. She asked if I grow miniature hostas, and they get lost. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, in a pot maybe they'd work, but no, they get lost in my gardens. It's another one of those things. Did I really, do I remember planting that? Where did I get that plant? Here's a lavender. Um, lavenders tend to have a little bit of problem in our, our, our climate. One of my friends will actually put a black pot over the top of her lavender in the winter to keep the snow and water off of them. They really like, they don't like to be overly wet. And in fact, in the nursery, we would only water those once a week where everybody else got watered daily because they really don't like to be overly wet. And that's a, a problem with our, you know, particularly this spring. We got puddles in our yard. And if our, if our lavender was there, it just drowned. We also don't trim our lavenders until the next spring because they grow off of their old tips. So we want to be careful about that too. Here's one of the new grasses. Um, this is a, a panicum or two new grasses. These are panicums. Um, related they are related to Cheyenne Sky, Shenandoah, Prairie Fire. Those are all, um, Patchy Rose is the newest of the ones that's going to give you like smoke. It's a burgundy smoke when it's in bloom. Very nice grass. Totem pole is one of the blues of the same family. Very upright, as you can see from the photograph. Very upright with that blue foliage. So if you're looking for something other than green, we have blue greens. The, these, the, um, the top one here is one of the penicetums. Penicetums belong to the family of Hamlin, uh, Little Kitten, um, uh, Purple Coneflower, or, or Purple Rubum, um, Purple Fountain Grass. That's all that same family. Um, Desert Plains is a new variety, and you can see we've got some purple in that on the foliage on the bottom. Blue Paradise is a, is a blue stem, a little blue stem. And I have one called Blue Heaven at my house that every time I walk by it, I, I break it. It falls over because it's very wispy. I like this one because it's very columnar, and it probably wouldn't break up if I bumped into it. So that's a very nice blue, um, blue stem, baby blue stem. This is pen, uh, Penicetum. Penicetum is a, 
um, the beard's tongue. Hummingbird lover, bird butterfly lover. Watching the bumblebee go into that flower is just really cool. You know, they, it's really wonderful. It's a, an improved native, I guess. Monarda or the bee bomb. Look at the colors on that. You know, with the dark pink in the center, the white on the outside, little frilly flower. That's a really, really good one. It says, doesn't run around. <laughs> We're all going to believe that, right? Bee bombs tend to be a bit invasive if they can. Cat's pajamas. This is a cat mint. And it's, I like this one because it's very upright. Our walker's low, and some of our others kind of spread out and creep and put down roots and become a, a huge mass. This one really looks like it's going to stay up. And again, when the flowers are past, the calyxes are a rosy purple. So we want to hit a lot of these have those calyxes, those flower bud covers that are going to remain colorful. Cloudburst flax. There's a whole bunch of these little short 20 to 26 inch floxes that bloom a little earlier, bloom a little longer. Obviously, they are not deer resistant because there's no deer on there. Um, they, the deer do like to prune mine, so I have to fence a lot of my flocks. Um, it's also mildew resistant, which is really good. Now the sedums. The one on the top, lemon jade. I've seen this bloom. And I did doctor this photograph to give you a yellow flower because yeah, lemon jade actually blooms green. Now my mother-in-law had, uh, had different sedums in her yard and she'd always ask, when's the broccoli gonna bloom? <laughs> not sure that you're gonna be able to tell the difference with lemon, lemon jade if she's in bloom or not because she, I, I doctored the photo so you can see the yellow because it, it, it does bloom yellow, but not as bright as that. I added some color. Popstar is a nice low mounding one, only 10 inches tall. When you're looking for your sedums, look for the sedums that don't get any taller than 18 inches, or you're going to have the split. So we want to make sure that they're 18 inches or lower. Bumble snow salvia. Whites are always important in the garden, particularly if you sit down on the porch like I do and look at my gardens at night, watching the bats eating the mosquitoes and having the, the whites in my gardens glow. I like blue. Here's the indigo girl salvia. These are all perennials. This is a, the salvias, of course, are full sun plants. Um, and this is indigo. Rabbits and deer resistant, rebloom if deadheaded. There's a pink one. This one I'm a little worried about because this type of foliage tends to mean it's going to bloom once and be done. Doesn't rebloom, but we'll, we'll have to test that one and see if it, if it comes back again. Violet blue flowers on this. Hummingbirds, butterflies, rebloom if you cut back. I have this one. I like blue. Crystal blue it was out last year, real late in the season, um, but it is a very, very pretty one, and it's at my house, and I like it because it's blue, but it's also white enough that it glows in the dark. Cutting inch, this is the Tiarella or the foaming bells, or fo foam flower. This is the other half of the, the corbel that makes a hookerella. Um, makes a nice little clump. Sometimes they will spread out a little bit. Um, they have white or light pink flowers on it. They'll bloom on and off all summer long if you deadhead those flowers. And this one, I didn't doctor the picture because it was already this chartreuse color. Oh, these are my, these are my other flowers. <laughs> and, a, and a close personal friend. <laughs> this, is, this is Greenlee. That's McKay and Ryder, the, the eight-year-olds that get into trouble. And that's Della. She's two. And then there's one in the oven. <laughs> so I'm pretty busy with, with these guys here. The, the uh, six-year-old wanted to take home a cactus that I just bought. And I figured it would end up in one of the eight-year-old's beds. So no. <laughs> no. OK, blue skywalker is a Veronica. Now, if I had a choice between Veronicas or Salvias, always go for Veronica. Veronica blooms longer, later, and blooms all summer long with deadheading. So, and I like the flowers. They're not as big as a Salvia, 
but they will um, continue to, to bloom. Anybody know where the Skywalker name comes from? Oops. Star Wars. Star Wars. And then, we, of course, we have a lightsaber <laughs> with the Star Wars. Um, deadheaded as often as you want to, and it will continue to bloom. Really like the, the Veronicas. And then we got the Wizard of Oz. Wow. Isn't that pretty? That is pretty. That is really pretty. Outstanding flower color. Very, very neat. Um, only 18, 18 inches tall or 16 inches tall. Very nice. Very, very nice. Now we're going to go on to annuals. Hey, I really, you know, when I started putting this program together, I've never done annuals before as far as a part of a program. So I, I saw that video and I thought, that's really neat. And, the, and all of those plants were new plants for this next year. And I highlighted a few of them in the next part of my program. Um, so if you were checking them off on the list, I, did, I skipped the super tunias. I skipped a color of the core of the, or the, um, the uh, I skipped some things. Let's just say, I, I skipped some things because there's things that I use in my own containers. And I do a lot of container gardens. I do nine baskets of containers. So I do a lot of container gardens. So I started with a marguerite. Marguerite gets to be about 36 inches tall. About, about like on the table, about like that. Flowered all summer long. Um, Puberman Winters actually sent two pecks, um, some teaser plants. They've had done that every year for 21 years. They didn't realize we weren't going to be in business this year. But so we still had these teaser plants. And this teaser plant, um, the marguerites, we had both colors, didn't need to be deadheaded. The flowers, the old flowers, fell down inside, and the new flowers would go up at the top. So when you've got 36 inches worth of growth, you've got some th good things going on. Did you get the, get the list? Yeah? And then there was the, there's two different ones, the white vanilla and the golden butterfly. Bidens. These can handle it hot, really, really hot. So this is one of the things that you can put at the park that you take care of and nobody waters anything because they'll grow very, very nice just with the hot. They're very drought tolerant. And not very big either. Uh, the Caladula or Calandula or whatever you want to call it, um, this is a wonderful plant. It's, it's an old plant. I used to remember 35 years ago planting this in my gardens. Um, but it's a, this is a new one, um, and it almost looks like a mum, don't you think? Almost looks like a mum. The a million bells. There are a million million bells. <laughs> um, I use million bells in my containers, in my hanging baskets a lot because they just bloom and bloom and bloom. Might need a little bit of deadheading, but I really like this ruby red one. I think that ruby red one and this white ones are going to be in my garden, in my baskets this year. But there's a, there's a lot more of these in that program, but these were the ones that I thought really were outstanding. Dahlias, short dahlias, only 30 inches tall, multi-branching, so you're going to get lots and lots of flowers. These are not those dinner plate dahlias, you only get one flower. You're going to have a, a mass of flowers, multi-branching these two um, varieties of dahlia. Senorita Kaliomi, these do not stink. <laughs> they do not stink. The Kaliomi tends to have an odor, and these do not have that odor. I planted the white one in one of my containers. It got to be about 18 to 36 inches tall, and I put some um, other fillers around it because, you know, you got to have that, that thriller, filler, spiller. Mm -hmm. And it worked real, really well as a thriller in, my, in my, one of my containers. Lantana, another one that is really drought tolerant. Put it out of the park where nobody's going to water it. It's going to bloom all summer, and you're going to have hummingbirds and butterflies attracted to it. It's very, very nice. It kind of gives me a rash. It's scratchy. So I'm a little bit allergic to the foliage, but once it's planted, it's done. Um, does, it, does it stink? I don't think so. I mean, the, the foliage is kind of a, has an odor, but I don't think the flowers do. This is a Mexican heather. The Mexican heather we're used to seeing has purple flowers. This is a little pink one. And again, it's very drought tolerant too. 
both the lantana and the um, Mexican heather in down south are considered weeds <laughs> because they will self-seed themselves, but not here. Osteosperm daisy or the African daisy, um, these are something that you can put out with your pansies early in the spring because they can tolerate a little bit of frost. Um, this one here has that double flower. Uh, osteosperm daisies also have a reputation of only blooming when it's cool. This one will bloom all the way through summer. And so will the orange one and so will the yellow one. Anything that has a name that starts with like soprano or alto or something that has to do with music will bloom all summer long. The others like Osti White will only bloom when it's cool. Early in the spring, late in the summer if it survives the summer. But that's the osteosperm daisies. Red hot phlox, a little short phlox. This is what you would use as a filler in your container because it really puffs out and it blooms all summer long and the hummingbirds and the butterflies like it. So it's a really nice plant. Only about 10 versus the thriller or the spiller. Salvia. Okay, this is where the, my rule about Veronica versus salvia doesn't count. <laughs> because these are, these are annual salvias. They're going to bloom all summer long with very little work. A lot of them will multi-branch. And you can deadhead if you want to to make them more compact. Usually when I plant an annual, I'll cut the flowers off if there's flowers on it already. Because I want it to branch out. I want it to spread. The million bells. I cut the tips on all of my million bells so they will branch out and, and be more full. So they, it's really a good idea to just give a little pruning when you're planting. It will save you having to prune it in August when it's too hot to be out there anyway. Another one, plain in the blues, another salvia. 48 inches tall. Now this is where we're going to start talking about the tomato cage. Because tomato cages don't work for tomatoes, right? <laughs> That little wire three ring thing works great for perennials. Put it around your perennials or your, or your annuals that are going to need some support. Put it right away, and then they're not going to fall over. So use a tomato cage. These are our black-eyed Susan vines. This one was in my garden last year. It is so cool. They're all a little bit shorter. They're only four foot tall. And I want to tell you about the, my front yard. I have a 10-foot pitcher window. And so I made myself a square foot box, 10 feet long, 1 foot by 1 foot, 10 feet long. After putting about 500 pounds of soil in it, I realized it wasn't going to be a window box. <laughs> it's a ground box. But it's in my front yard. It's made out of cedar. I mean, I, I spared no expense. But I put fences behind it, and I grow the black-eyed Susan vine on it. I did do um, acorn squash one year, but we put down new sod, and my husband likes his sod to be green. And it splashed the acorn squash. You know what happened to my acorn squash? Powdery mildew. So I don't put acorn squash in my, my ground box anymore. It goes in the backyard where I control the watering. But these are very, very wonderful. And like I say, all of them are going to be about four foot, which is about the height of my fence in my garden. This one I, I, is going to sell out. Wherever you see this, buy it. This is, a, this is Stormburst uh, Verbena. It did not need to be deadheaded all last summer. It had softball size flower clusters. And this picture doesn't show you just how blue it was. The blue and white. This is a very neat Verbena. And if I get to them first, you don't get any. Because this, this is, this is going to be a hot item. Blew my mind, Evolvulus. This is a, um, there's another one called Blue Days. Doesn't bloom as nice as this one. Um, likes it really, really hot. One of my hangers always has Blue Days in it or, or, or Blew My Mind. Hot, full sun, just loves it. And, and look at that blue. Yeah, I like blue. Did I tell you that? <laughs> New Guinea and patience. We all know about the um, little four-pack patients that get the downy mildew. Um, this is an alternative. Downy mildew is a, plant, a disease that came from the Carolinas. 
hit Cedar Rapids about three years ago. You, about midsummer, your, your regular impatience lose all their leaves and just have a couple flowers on the bottom, look horrible, don't do anything. It's a disease that is in the soil and it's windblown. So if you haven't seen it yet, you will. This is an alternative. The New Guinea impatience have bigger flowers. There are bigger plants, so you don't need as many to fill that bed in. And uh, they'll tell you when they wa need water, because they'll do this. <laughs> I, I often think that my husband doesn't listen to me. Yeah, nobody else had that problem, right? <laughs> well, one day I came home from work, and he said, you've got, you've got herbicide drift on your plant outside. So I went outside. It was a New Guinea impatient. I watered it and popped back up. But I thought, he was listening to me when I was talking about herbicide drift on um, lilacs and other things. So I was kind of impressed. <laughs> Sometimes I don't think he listens. I, I, I was teaching a class on trees, and he says, you don't know anything about trees. I said, I know a lot more than you think I know <laughs> when it comes down to it. Perfectly pink angelonia. If you've got a mailbox and you want something to be at your mailbox and you want it to stay and be able to handle the salt and the sand and the brime and all that stuff that the street that's put on and that hot concrete, Angelonia is your girl. Angelonia is a summer snapdragon, they, is a common name. Blooms all summer long with a little bit of deadheading occasionally. Um, attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, and bumblebees. So when you go to the mailbox, kind of do this before you get to the mailbox because it does uh, attract the bees. It's a really wonderful plant. And it comes in, this is a new color that's perfectly pink, but it's, you know, there's violet, there's blue, there's white, there's red, all different colors of, of Angelonia. But she's your girl. Oh, she's also a cut flower. I didn't put a many scissors in here. I, when I started doing this program, I thought, I need a cut flower for program. So I kind of got sidetracked and put together a cut flower program, and so I didn't get back to putting the scissors in all these. Surefire begonia. This, this one and Mr. Big were out last year. And look how big this guy gets. 18 inches to 2 feet tall. I put one 4-inch pot in a 2-gallon crock. One 4-inch pot in a 2-gallon crock. It filled it and got 2 feet tall in my crock. Bloomed all summer, sun or shade. And it was really, really quite wonderful. It comes in whites, pinks, and, and reds. Red and pink, I didn't have a picture of the white. Here's our gara. We kind of call this a butterfly plant because the flowers look like butterflies. I heard a couple of oohs when we were watching the video. Because it's a very, very pretty plant. Use this for your thriller. Put it in your thriller pot and use something else for filler and spiller. Okay, there we are again. Okay. These are, these are the resources that I stole my photographs from. Just in case any of them are copyrighted, I have given them credit. This is my backyard. Just part of my backyard. A little bit of information about this grass here. That's Blondo. And about seven years ago, Cedar Rapids had a five-foot freeze. And that one there died. The one that didn't die between me and this gentleman here, not even six feet away, didn't I? It was a piece that I put on the end of a fence because I didn't know where else to put it. Now, why the one that was the perfect backdrop for my, for my um, wishing well died, I don't know. Hmm. So I didn't do the grass program for about four years because I didn't want to hear about everybody's miscanthus grasses that died. <laughs> so that's it. There's my backyard. And oh, I guess there's not another one. This is the top half of my backyard. The bottom half of the ba backyard is quite large, and I was not allowed to plant in that one because my husband, when we bought the house, wanted a yard big enough that you could throw a football and not have to go in the neighbor's yard to get it. <laughs> my children are now 32 <laughs> and 30, and some of my beds are encroaching on that ball playing field. <laughs> But, but there you go. Thank you. Thank you.